We now have um, over Skype um, Hamad Nazar, uh, who's uh, unfortunately not able to be with us. And uh, there are, as we've mentioned before as well, reasons. So to let, tell you a little bit more, Hamad is a curator, writer, and researcher, uh, now back in London, uh, where he has been for a number of years. Um, apart from the time when he was also head of uh, research and programs at Asia Art Archive, Hong Kong, between 2012 and 16, where he has also looked at um, various research initiatives, particularly as well how to uh, invent and uh, think through with his um, excellent team how to archive um, in South Asia and initiatives are still ongoing. Um, there's also now in Hamad's new position at, as research fellow, senior research fellow at Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art. They will be continuing this collaboration with Asia Art Archive. Um, so that's something I'm personally very in, interested in, in the kind of complexity with which uh, Hamad has thought through um, Asia and the Asian diaspora for a number of years, um, including at the work that he was doing for the nonprofit's arts organization Green Cardamom between 2004 and 2012. Um, further, more recent are the curated uh, projects such as Rock, Paper, Scissors positions in play at the 57th Venice Biennale this year. Um, and another exhibition that has been uh, of an important example um, for me as well when, when working on My East is Your West is the show Lines of Control, Partition as a Productive Space at Johnson Museum, Cornell University and National Museum, Duke University, 2012 and 13. But again, that project included um, not only the exhibition, but also uh, conferences and writing, um, which, which still serves as an important resource. Um, so I'll conclude there, but uh, hand over to Hamad and uh, we have uh, alongside, again, we have our web audience and we have audience here. so. Um, hope you enjoy the last session for today. Um, well, well, thank you uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, and, and firstly, apologies. I would love to have been there um, in person, but I'm really uh, grateful to Pratik, Priyanka, uh, Natasha, the, the experimenter team, in making it possible for me to be there at least uh, uh, virtually. So, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, echoing Natasha's point, um, I think it is really important and efforts like what you have been doing for the last seven years in having sort of critical conversations, um, uh, which are, you know, critical friends um, and coming from viewpoints uh, all around the world, I think are in incredibly important for, for us to have different voices forging a, an expanded idea of the international. Um, and with that in mind, what I wanted to do in the next half an hour, and I'm going to put my stopwatch on, so at least I know how, um, how late I am. Um, uh, so in the next half an hour, I'm going to uh, share with you three projects. Uh, two of, in fact, all three uh, Natasha has alluded to already. Um, I'm not going to try and, and cram uh, descriptions of artworks, uh, um, um, into this, um, but really um, uh, just sort of walk through the journeys of, uh, of putting these projects together and, and sharing sort of some of my own learnings and, and some of the things that have uh, flowed out of them. Uh, with that, uh, I think we can sort of switch to the PowerPoint. Um, and I'll sort of try and link through the three things, uh, this, uh, the exhibition, uh, the research that informs it, uh, and uh, an archive that quite often fuels it. Um, and, and for me, um, exhibitions really are a way to think with artists and through art about the world, you know, about questions niggling, uh, niggling at me and, and stay, continue to niggle. Uh, the first project I want to speak about is uh, Lines of Control. Next. Um, and as uh, Natasha sort of introduced, um, it, it was not a singular exhibition, but actually a long durée project 
project that started in 2005 and uh, its last iteration was in 2013. The image that you see here uh, is from its largest iteration at the Cornell's Johnson Museum. And the experimenter crowd can probably recognize um, and one of the new commissions for that, that project was Nadia Kabilinkes, All Along the Watchtower. Um, and on the left side, you can see Gauri Gill. On the right is Shilpa Gupta. And the red wall uh, in the middle is, of course, the red line of the Oslo Accord uh, by decolonizing architecture. But what I uh, want to do next, please, is... Uh, take you back to the um, to the start of the project um, and, and here in uh, in the UK uh, we had there is a tendency to remember partition every 10 years oh. uh, and uh, I must own up to my part of, of that uh, 10 years ago uh, oh. or slightly more than 10 years ago um, and back in 2005 I was sort of very curious uh, as to to investigating why uh, the event of the partition, which I don't need to uh, explain the context to this uh, crowd, but you know, between 47 and 71, uh, 25 million people displaced, 3 million people dead. But it's left a very small mark in the world's um, visual memory. And I wanted to explore this lacuna as to you know, why that was the case. Not through this idea of uh, its trauma and its aftermath, but really to try and engage with partition's literal capacity to produce things. You know, it produces nations, borders, new histories, it reconfigures memories. Um, and this is not something which, um, you know, which is not new. Uh, I must sort of uh, point to both events in the real world, so things like Ayodhya, uh, the work that came out uh, in 1997, or uh, the events of Gujarat, and how artists, particularly in India, responded to their contemporary surroundings through the lens of art, but also earlier, uh, earlier efforts, uh, the Eicher Gallery's mapping project in 97, or Arpar, the artistic project of Shilpa Gupta and Puma Mulji, as really key markers. Uh, and so what, what we did next, please. Um, what we ended up doing with, uh, was to hold a, a workshop at the Royal Geographical Society, where many of the, uh, of the world's lines were indeed drawn. Um, and it was chaired by uh, Sarat Maharaj, um, you know, um, and was co-convened with Moti Roti, the, uh, the artist organization, and Green Cardamom. Um, and I had gone in there with this idea that I will, for to mark 60 years, produce three different exhibitions that will look that will stage partition and act as some kind of memorial. To, uh, you know, the attempt was to try and correct the wrong of there not being uh, the, this sort of this markers in visual memory. Uh, and very gently, um, Sarath Maharaj very gracefully sort of intellectually slapped me around a little bit to say, you know, what, what is this fixation with doing a big exhibition? And why 60, why not 62 or 64? Uh, so to cut a long story short, um, I went in there looking for exhibitions, came out thinking really about a constellation of events uh, that will feed off each other uh, and perhaps inform uh, the contemporary that we're living through. So over the next maybe 10 minutes, I'm just going to walk you through um, this, this journey within lines of control. Um, next, please. Uh, next. So very quickly after that workshop, which took place in December, uh, next year, um, I started a fellowship at Goldsmiths. And so what you'll now start seeing is the red tells you a bit about the project and the white tells you what's happening in the world. I'm not going to speak to all of them because we don't have the time. But, uh, but uh, at Experimenta, you have both the physical book and a PDF that can be then shared uh, as we move forward. Uh, but sorry, so if you go back one, and I just sort of stick to um, the fellowship at Goldsmiths uh, um, and, and point to uh, Erit Rogoff, who was another sort of uh, crucial um, intellectual sparring partner. 
um, and who sort of supervised my research fellowship there on uh, lines of control. Um, and then, as you can see, in sort of 2007 and 8, began a, a, an extended and multifarious conversation with artists, with filmmakers, who have long and engaged uh, practices uh, in which they are also trying to make sense of uh, partition uh, through its histories, but also through contemporary registers. And it's that really that informing uh, the thinking. Um, it was supposed to lead up to a, a symposium in Karachi, uh, Nalani Malani, who, as many of you know, was born in Karachi, but never had been back. Amar Kanwar, uh, Rux Media Collective were supposed to come over. Uh, and then we had the Bombay terrorist attack. Uh, um, not surprisingly, that uh, symposium got canceled. The exhibition itself had to be postponed. Um, and uh, next. Uh, and it finally took place in, in 2009. It's in its first iteration. Next. And it took place as a sort of a distributed exhibition in three different spaces in Karachi, Dubai, and London. Uh, and then those three exhibitions were brought together later in 2009 at Cartwright Hall and Ilkley up in Bradford. Um, next. Um, this exhibition and this sort of tripartite exhibition um, allowed us to, to work uh, with, uh, with artists to create new work. So, uh, Naim Mohayman's Kazi in No Man's Land, uh, which you may, uh, which a work that you may know, uh, in which he sort of caused a run on a particular stamp in, in the Bangladesh uh, post office. Uh, it really uh, looked at the only instance that, that we know of where a, the same person has been depicted on stamps of all three South Asian uh, countries, so Pakistan, India, uh, and Bangladesh. And the person, of course, is the poet Ghazi Nazrul Islam. But apart from commissioning new works, next, one of the real joys of working on this project, um, and, and sort of pointing in particular to the work on the left here, uh, next, which you can see a detail of, was um, Anita Dubey's River Disease, was to bring back uh, into circulation works that had sort of dropped out. Um, so I first uh, got to know of this work um, and, and asked for a, an image uh, for, for a piece I was writing. And Anita actually did not even have uh, a good uh, high-res image for, uh, in her own records. Uh, and that led to a conversation in which it sort of invited her to recreate that work. Um, similarly, um, uh, next, we had a recreation of the work that was probably the first um, artistic collaboration between India and Pakistan, between Iftikhar Dadi and Nalani Malani. Next, uh, what you're seeing here are the, the Radcliffe lines. Um, and, and, and they're sort of done with, uh, with tinsel, really, for, with gota, for uh, used uh, normally to, um, to decorate wedding dresses. Next. Um, at that stage, uh, there was an invitation from Cornell to bring the exhibition uh, to uh, the Johnson Museum. And I'll sort of talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but alongside that was also another ex uh, exhibition I was part of the curatorial team of at the Whitechapel called Where Three Dreams Cross, um, 150 Years of Photography in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And one of the very interesting things out of that was that the, the, the lead curator for that was Sunil Gupta, who had made it very much a condition of his uh, practice that he did not want to depict uh, any dead bodies in the show. Um, so part of the challenge was to then think through, if you're looking at these 150 years of, of, uh, of South Asia without dead bodies, uh, how do we make the dead bodies speak? Um, and in that way, we sort of came upon the idea of using a symposium that would then address uh, the legacies of partition in that way. Uh, next. 
And I'm going to sort of speed up here, uh, just sort of bringing you up to date. Uh, so this was a project, Gauri Gill, um, which she had started uh, when we started a conversation. And then we invited her to, to finish and present in our little space in London at Green Cardamom. Um, uh, and it looked at the Hindu and Sikh population that left Afghanistan in the late 80s and 90s to move to, uh, to Delhi called What Remains. Uh, next. Um, we then had the opportunity to curate a small pocket version of the project next um, in, in the headquarters of the British Council. Uh, so you can see Gauri's work right at the back wall, right in front, you see a work by uh, David Aylesworth, the Hyde Park Kashan in which he looks at gardens, empire, uh, through the lens of exhibitions. Next. Coming back to Cornell, um, and, and I sort of point to another person, uh, Ellen Averill, who's the chief curator at the Johnson Museum. Because um, when, when she made the invitation, I think she was inviting a group of objects to move across the Atlantic. But I think what she hadn't uh, taken into account, but then full marks to her, was this extended conversation uh, with, uh, with, the cure, uh, with myself to say, look, I'm not terribly interested in just moving objects around. If this is going to take new form in Cornell, we need to engage with both the histories of Cornell itself but also think in a wider way that we can engage with the, uh, with the community. A first part of that was to involve uh, Iftikhar Dadi, uh, who had been part of Lines of Control as, uh, as an artist right from the start, but also to bring him into the curatorial team to work with me. Um, and Nada Raza, who was sort of uh, at Green Cardamom at the time, working on the project from 2007 onwards. Uh, but also people like Salah Hassan, uh, the eminent scholar who uh, sort of uh, who led the Center for Africana Studies, so that it could become um, a vehicle to really engage uh, Cornell's uh, unique capabilities. Um, next. Um, you can see on the left uh, a work by Herr Sarkisian. Well, well, we want, that's the sort of the wall hanging. So we're bringing Armenia in here. Uh, you see in the uh, in the wall hanging up for the entrance uh, a sliver of Rashid Rana's All I Skyward work. Um, next. But it was really important to also engage with the site of Cornell, uh, which is on Iroquois land. So Jolene Ricard, uh, who is both a scholar and an artist and Cornell's faculty, we commissioned a new work that looked at the medicine line between the US and Canada. Uh, and how the, the nation state did violence to that in terms of indig indigenous uh, populations. Next, uh, Tom Malloy, the Irish artist. So this is an existing work in which he covers a small commercially available gl globe um, um, with, with white paint uh, until the, the only thing visible are the man-made lines. So it's really a way to extend the uh, uh, the scope, the geographic scope of the exhibition. I think this work sort of captures it. Next. Uh, with Young Hei Chang Heavy Industries, uh, and for those of you who don't know them, um, I would urge you to go to YouTube and look up this work uh, called Cunnilingus in North Korea. It is hilarious, uh, deep, profound, and wonderful uh, as a way of thinking about, uh, about borders. So not only were we able to show an existing work. We were also able to commission new works, which is uh, very important to me for, for, for the exhibition, also to be an opportunity for the artists who are participating beyond just uh, um, the chance to show existing work. Next. Um, and the last sort of show, uh, the work from um, Lines of Control I'll show here was also another commission uh, a takeaway uh, which bore three lines um, of poetry, of poets from the subcontinent, uh, Tagore, Faiz, and Aga Shahid Ali, a work of Rux Media Collective, 
all three poets uh, deal with this idea of, of strangers and how lines or, or borders can turn friends into strangers. Next. One of the most um, meaningful things uh, I think anybody has ever said to me uh, after an exhibition was one of the students here uh, who said, why can't all exhibitions be like this one? Uh, and, and I think um, uh, the exhibition was literally built by the MFA class and, and students from the architecture uh, faculty at Cornell. And you can probably, the eagle-eyed among, among you can probably spot the, that uh, on the sort of the smaller ladders is also the, the artist Nadia Kabilinke, who after having finished her own installation was then helping one of the students install Shilpa's work. So this idea of literally, you know, the entire Ithaca community coming together to build this show is what made it possible. Next. Um, next. One of the projects that came out of it, and again, to prove that point around, uh, to illustrate that point about the, the role of this conversation with artists and curators, um, Sophie Ernst um, started a particular project which now is called Home. Um, back in 2006. So we started that conversation together. And during this time, so from 20, 2006 to 12, uh, her project developed with, with many of the iterations of, uh, of Lines of Control. Next, until its final realization at Yorkshire Sculpture Park uh, as a full-blown exhibition and a beautiful uh, publication that, that went alongside it. Next. Um, and as, now, as you see, those white references suddenly start changing. So I, I'm personally, I now move to Hong Kong. So we start looking at the world coming from the South China Sea rather than the North Atlantic or the Indian Ocean that we're more comfortable with. Next. So the pr project keeps developing. Uh, next. Its last iteration was at Duke. Um, this carpet is not David Aylesworth, but Mona Hatoum. So it continues to grow and has echoes with where it goes. Next. Uh, and again. And the world keeps on you know, dealing or trying to deal with its lines of control. Uh, until we come up to, to, to Brexit. And I suppose that's the point where we leave uh, lines of control, and I will come back to it towards the end. But I wanted to stop for uh, half a minute and just think about, uh, I mean, in preparation for, for this talk, I was just thinking about this journey, this uh, in particular, how this exhibition, I mean, I've talked about what an opportunity for artists, but just also thinking about the opportunity for me. Um, this was really a platform for self-learning. And that's not just the formal um, education that came out of, say, Goldsmiths or involvement with uh, at Cornell or Duke, but it was with also having these conversations, long durée, over years conversations with artists like Amar Kanwar or Nalani Malani or Shilpa Gupta or Sophie Ernst, and really um, occupying the, these ideas and making making them your own. The, the, the exhibition also, and, and you saw that with what the students did, is it became a machine for collaboration. Uh, I've, told, I've told you about Nada Raza, who will be speaking here tomorrow, who was very much part of the core team for this exhibition uh, project, but also Reem Fadda, um, who had just left or leaving Cornell, but contributed ideas and insights into what uh, doing a show at this university museum meant. But above all, I think this timeline, and, and this is what I, the, the big, big point that I wanted to make, was, was really just about time itself, as to what it allows, what it makes possible uh, for things to grow organically. I mean, there is a Gujarati saying that uh, if you're going to eat an elephant, do it in small bites. I think that was very much uh, a part of lines of control. Uh, and if I'm going to sort of uh, tweak it a little bit, I think it helps if you have time to digest and if you have a whole bunch of friends that you can invite to the party. We're going to switch to the next project. Um, and if we're talking about time, uh, if lines of control was like, um, like 
kunna. I don't know if you're familiar with that dish, which in traditional recipes would be cooked in, a, in an earthen pot buried in the sand so that the meat cooks in its own fat uh, through the sun, you know, through the sun. So it's a long durée cooking. So if the lines of control was like kunna, rock, paper, scissors is a stir fry. Um, you know, both have their, their place in, in a balanced palate. Uh, but I just wanted to, oh, I'm giving told 10 minutes. Okay, I, I see you. Um, but both uh, sort of the kunna and the stir fry have their place. Um, and with rock, paper, scissors, I was appointed in October uh, 26. And the exhibition opened in uh, May 2017 with a book, which Kevin has kindly brought uh, for the audience there, which, which you uh, will be able to see. So again, I'm not going to spend time talking through uh, artist projects and works because uh, that's available for you, both in physical format, but also PDFs are with uh, Pratik and Priyanka, who you, you, they're very welcome to share with those who are, or, or are interested. But I'll speak for a few minutes uh, just really about um, what I was trying to do with this project and the difficulties and possibilities that something like Venice and something like a national pavilion opens up. Uh, firstly, to address this idea of play. And uh, uh, play was something that was really coming out of uh, my own observations of diverse practices that I'd seen in the UAE, uh, you know, coming back and forth over the last 10 years. I'd seen sort of practices that dealt with collection, repetition, the application of uh, arbitrary rules, flights of fancy, record keeping, photographs, gestures based on experimentation and performance. Um, and what sort of stayed with me was a series of questions, you know, as to where is this play coming from? Uh, how and where is it being nurtured? And what does it do? And I think in particular for the UAE, where uh, about 85% of its um, local population are not citizens. I was particularly interested in the idea of what play could be as a vehicle in making a place home. Because home and a nation for me are, are cultural constructs that cannot be restricted to passports or ethnicity. You know, home is the food we eat, the stories we share, the songs we sing, and certainly the games we play. And it's through that lens that I wanted to, to look uh, at the exhibition. And there were a few things that I sort of set out for myself. Uh, one, that I wanted to be able to, for it to, um, to be able to showcase distinctive positions. So not just sort of single works where you get a flavor, but you at least get some idea of an artist's practice. I wanted to cross generations. I was interested in these genealogies I, I'm not a fan of what I call the unhinged contemporary, uh, contemporary that is not in critical dialogue with its past. And I was particularly curious to see genealogies that go outside uh, the narrow worlds of visual art, in particular, given the richness of literature and theater uh, in this part of the world. Um, lastly, I was very keen to add to what was already circulating. Um, next, please. So, so there, there is a genealogy of uh, an artist called Hassan Sharif, who you, you may have seen in, in, in Venice, uh, who went to Bayam Shaw School of Art and flippantly was sort of dubbed playful, came back, taught everybody. Uh, and that's kind of like the, the very standard patrilineal kind of art history that in a way is kind of common to lots of places. Lots of places have these histories of, you know, male artists goes elsewhere, comes back and then teaches everybody. Uh, and, it, and I was very curious to see how we could complicate that. Um, uh, next. I'm not gonna have time to go through many of these slides, so I'll pick on maybe just one or two. Um, on Vikram Devecha, uh, this particular project called Degenerative Dis Disarrangement at first sight, it you know it looks like abstraction or minimalism. Reminds me of jazz or ideas of syncopation and rhythms. Next, but when you go up uh, into the sort of the mezzanine floor from which that picture was taken, you see on iPads that those bricks are actually coming out of uh, 
of road repairs at a bus stop. So what I was really struck by was what happens when, and I think Pedro talked about this earlier also, is when you take things out of one circuit, so the municipal, and put them into another, the art world. And what I was particularly struck, if you sort of look at, uh, and you can see by just the way people look and how they're sitting, that the folks who are working on the Dubai uh, streets are, are, are from South Asia. I was struck by this, you know, there's this term called Gulf return, which is normally meant to uh, applied to people who go work in the Gulf countries for a few years, accumulate capital, come back. Uh, and then they have accumulated this both economic and social capital. And, and to me, these bricks became a bit like that. You know, they, they are now going, going to Venice, that they're going to sit for six months and accumulate art world capital. And when they come back to the UAE, they will become Venice return. <laughs> Uh, next, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have time to be able to talk about this work, but I will point out that Nujum al Ghanim is better known as a filmmaker, but is also a poet and an artist. And this was one of her poems that was unpublished in 1984, because you can see what she's trying to do with geometric shapes and the text. Uh, and what we were then able to do was to produce a, uh, a very small number of books that would finally publish it in the form that she wanted. Uh, next, I'm going to have to skip this bit, but uh, but but I, as we go, flip through this, I will just sort of narrate the uh, where it came out of. When Hassan Sharif, the artist that I mentioned, when first back back to the UAE, his first artistic group was not with visual artists, but with poets and writers. And Najum Al Ghanim uh, and her now husband Khalid Al Badur. Were, were two of them. Uh, ne next. Got it. And they ended up sharing a studio, uh, working together, sort of let's, let's move on. And, and more. Let's just keep working through. So yes, you, you can see theater, you can see writing uh, coming through here. And what ended up uh, happening is, sorry, if you could go back, is that Najum was not able to, um, to publish Najum and Khalid because they had an quote unquote unofficial ban in the, in the local uh, press. So they did what any self-respecting artist does anywhere. They took out a zine, which they self-published and then distributed, uh, you know, photocopied and then distributed. Um, as, and once they did that, they were banned from doing that as well. So they did what any, sorry, if you could go back. They then changed the format of their magazine. They said, okay, issue two will not be an, a, a magazine anymore. It will be an exhibition. Uh, without taking any permissions, they staged this exhibition right in front of the gold souk in Sharjah. So the idea of placing rocks in front of gold, again, there was this lovely contemporary echo with Bikram's work where bricks are accumulating art world value. So these issues of value are coming to play. Next. And this exhibition too was kind of disbanded in three hours and they were, they were told no more exhibitions for you. And then that group disbanded and the rest of art history, uh, I kind of sort of summarized uh, earlier for you and it, which is in the making. Next. So what we did next for the exhibition is reproduce that photocopied journal complete with the chewing gum that they had stuck on top. Uh, unfortunately, those uh, chewing gums that used to come with their own paper wrapper uh, were not available anymore. We tried to look in three different continents, couldn't get them. So you see the silver foil, but, uh, but keeping with that gesture of 20 copies. So 20 copies were made available um, every day, so 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, uh, so people could, could take away. Next. Uh, let's just flip through this. So the, this is what's in the journal. You can look at this in the book. Uh, let's move on. Next. Next. Um, just one minute on the book itself. Um, the book is a um, is also for me an extension of the exhibition. 
So in the spirit of what Sil Salat al Ramad were doing, there are actually artist commissions in the book. Next. Next. So you're looking at Watad magazine mapping the informal spaces of play in, in the UAE. Next. Or uh, Ramin and Rokni Herzadeh and Hassam, who, who literally built a playground within the book. So this, for example, if you pause on this, the, the images that you see are the South Asian carpenters and craftsmen who make their project, who make their objects. But because they don't have a common language, so you know, the artists speak Farsi and English, the, the workers speak you know, South Asian languages and smattering of Arabic, they, the, the artists would end up performing their instructions uh, to the workers. So what came out would probably have nothing or very little in relation to what they had in mind, but then the artists would use that in their work. Uh, and the last bit that I wanted to talk about in uh, relation to this project was the contribution by the fiction writer Deepak Unikrishnan, who wrote six new fables for, for the book, but apart from them, also worked with the designers to, to morph one of his existing uh, stories, which is called Gulf Return, and which looks at uh, three laborers uh, who escape from their labor camp. One becomes a passport, one becomes a suitcase, the other is the passenger who carries them onto a plane and then starts to consume the entire plane as it takes off. So it is both laugh out loud, very, very dark. Uh, and then what you could do in the pavilion is, is fold these planes and launch them from, from the top so that Gulf Return could meet Venice Return. Um, I'm, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop it there. Uh, but there's some, you know, there are other projects that you could look at uh, within uh, within the UAE. But maybe just to end, uh, if you could just go right to the end, and we can talk about London Asia maybe in conversation. Yeah. But I wanted to end with art as we started, because I talked about art being as a way for me and with working with artists, a way to think through uh, life. And I'm going to end with an artist that you will recall uh, from Lines of Control, Sophie Ernst. This is a work, uh, Silent Empress, which was a public commission for Yorkshire Sculpture Park in Wakefield in 2012, where Sophie attached a sound tag to a public statue of Queen Victoria. God knows we have enough of them spread around the world. Uh, the sound was a monologue emanating from a megaphone temporarily positioned in front of the statue's face, comprising quotes from journals and letters of Queen Victoria and extracts from speeches and texts by you know, Blair, Brown, Cameron, Churchill, Gladstone. It gestured towards an apology for Britain's colonial past. The statue spoke for 30 minutes before Wakefield Council decided it was disrespectful and needed to come down. Yeah, so this was unfortunate. Uh, I think we need our statues to speak uncomfortable truths. The cultural sphere in functioning democracies should be a profoundly unsafe space for sacred cows. Um, and I think it's that idea uh, uh, that, that is sort of informing uh, the thinking behind London Asia that, uh, that Britain uh, is kind of blind to its uh, imperial history. Um, and one of the things that I argue is that, uh, you know, you can be English and Scottish or Welsh or from Northern Ireland, but you cannot be British. We cannot be British if we fail to recognize our Indianness. And I say we very knowingly, as I have British sons who, who reminded me that I may be Asian, but they're British when we were moving to Hong Kong. Uh, and I think as we move here in this country towards Brexit, uh, and we are resetting our national conversation here as to who gets to call Britain home. Uh, and I think we have to remind ourselves that home and nation are cultural constructs. And any meaningful articulation of Britishness, which is compelling enough to embrace our multiple allegiances, requires us to let our statues speak, to recognize our Indianness, and learn to live with our partitioned selves. Thank you.
Thank you, Hamad. Um, that was very synthetic, and I know um, that you um, also excluded uh, a whole lot of, um, of what you've been keeping busy with um, before coming also to uh, this uh, stir-fry project of uh, realizing the UAE Pavilion. So I wanted to just go a little bit back to the years that you've spent um, at the Asia Art Archive. Um, because this was also the time when, um, of course, also through the uh, work that Sabi Ahmed and the team uh, here continues to do, there were multiple efforts to think um, strategically on how to archive uh, practices of the subcontinent, uh, knowing that um, there are a lot of missing pieces and uh, also how these, in, in fact, these fragmented histories um, of the subcontinent also affect um, how we can think through the, uh, the artists' own um, training, uh, their diasporic lives, um, and um, through um, a, a time when the artist as, as prolific organizer um, was also a collector of those histories. Um, so maybe if you could just share a little bit of the, uh, the, the kind of methodologies that uh, you and the team were trying to uh, bring about uh, the last few years, also particularly to do with language. Um, and I know you've spoken about this before, uh, transliteration and bibliographies and all of this. Just a little bit, if you could uh, share. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a monster of a question. And I'll, and I'll try and keep it short, uh, and then we can expand if, 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 uh, if people are interested. Um, I think um, I was very lucky to join Asia Art Archive at a point where I often would say it had been building muscle for you know 12 years, um, and my job was to come and help the team flex um, and, and figure out for what purpose uh, and and how we could operate. Um, I think one thing which was very clear and uh, and and we sort of moved on it very quickly is that there is no uh, there is no possibility of anything called comprehensive or complete um, and and rather than uh, you know perpetually trying to reach that I think what we need to do is uh, is to develop a mode of working which is propositional uh, speculative uh, but generous and in that generosity is this idea of sharing uh, sharing not just output, but input. Um, and I'll sort of give an give example. Um, say, I mean, we, uh, Pedro had mentioned the, uh, the art historian John Clark, who is one of these sort of art historical savants who has done primary research in five languages, uh, you know, from Japanese to Chinese to Thai, uh, and has done extensive work in India. Now, you can uh, read John's books and you can agree with him or disagree with him, but wouldn't it be wonderful if you could get access to his 30 years of interviews with people like Ghulam Sheikh that have been done over decades, where he'd go back and come and repeat the same things? Well, it's those kinds of projects that we actually prioritize. Um, so many of those interviews are now available online. Uh, and when you start, um, you know, for me, um, history in the singular is indistinguishable from propaganda. Uh, so I'm very interested in histories in the plural and how we can develop tools um, as well as narratives. Narratives are interesting because they pre present a proposition or a perspective. Tools are interesting and generative because they allow others to do so. Um, and I think one of the sort of the big, uh, what we did in the last few years at uh, Asia at Archive is to better articulate um, our priorities in terms of what kinds of tools we are generating and also identify sort of specific, uh, what we call sort of content priorities and language, for instance. So Sabi uh, Ahmed uh, had, had already started a project which was uh, doing a bibliography. Uh, so Sabi and Sneha, um, who are based in Delhi, and, and I would encourage you all to go and visit um, 
them and the wonderful work they have, they have been doing. Uh, looking at uh, writings um, in 13 um, languages uh, across 100 years, uh, and 13 Indian languages, of course, including English, um, and, 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 so, and, and the idea was, okay, now we start putting this together, what can you do with it? Uh, and what we ended up doing, and I'll sort of cut to the chase, we ended up developing a, an online resource um, which you can access uh, from, from the website. Uh, it's a, a bibliog bibliographic resource. Um, but then how do you search in languages that you cannot read about artists that you do not know uh, by, by, by writers that you do not know? So then we worked with a, a data visualizer in Canberra, Mitchell Whitelaw, to develop prototypes uh, to, to sit on top of this database, which will allow us points of entry uh, and which come up with, allow us to look at how people were perhaps referencing, say, Marx um, and Kabir in the same text. So that allow us to open different genealogies of, of, uh, of art history that start questioning what it means, you know, what is the, this genre of art writing? Um, and why couldn't four pages in a communist rag uh, in Malayalam uh, have the same standing or, or have a contribution to make uh, as opposed to English language journals coming out of Delhi or Bombay? And I think it was this kind of, um, of project uh, which then also asked us questions. So uh, within Asia Archive, we had this, this project was called the, the Bibliography of Modern and Contemporary Indian Art Writing. Uh, and after an initial bit of skirmish saying, why India, why modern, why contemporary, we let it go. But just you know, a year and a half ago before it was fully being launched, so the same team that we were having these arguments with saying, why India, why this, were saying, actually, this can't be India. Uh, because the language, of course, does not recognize uh, the national boundary. So if you're going to do a Bengali language research, you have to go to Dhaka. If you're going to Urdu, you know, you start in Lahore, or if you, you have to follow Tamil to Jaffna uh, and, and elsewhere. And once you start doing that, I think you start, um, you start enmeshing your histories, which I think are really productive. Uh, and I personally find much more interesting then a kind of a nationalist or it's um, you know ugly twin uh, regional histories that 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 kind of the institutions are almost pre-programmed into uh, into developing i'm going to pause for breath We're pausing for breath with you, but I'm also waiting for questions from the audience. Um, there's one right there. Um, thanks for this really insightful presentation. Um, I'm really interested to see how in, I, w I was really interested to see how in lines of control um, the layers and the temporal conversations built up through the years. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, reflection on the challenges and the learnings that come out of such a long durational kind of putting together such a long project over so many years? Um, I think one of the, the single biggest challenges is um, is you know how could you sustain such a uh, such a thing just in terms of um, energy, but more practically also in terms of funding, in some terms, terms of uh, possibilities. Um, and I think the short answer to that is with great difficulty. Um, and the only way this project uh, has uh, unraveled and unfolded as it has has be uh, has been because of uh, uh, generosity, uh, generosity of people, of, uh, of institutions, um, of, uh, and of curiosity, um, uh, and this sort of, uh, a collective will. So for example, 
you, you could question why would um, the third line gallery, a commercial gallery in Dubai, host a, an exhibition uh, in which hardly anything, I think, sold um, of, you know, of, of South Asia's sort of partition uh, um, in, in, in prime time, you know, sort of in, I think, January uh, 2009. And I think partly that was also an element of solidarity of thinking about, well, how do we how do we think of this? Um, so when the when the exhibition opened in Dubai, I remember uh, a couple of our friends from from writing for newspapers wanted to talk about oh, because Gaza was being bombed literally at that time, and there was like oh, how how did you put together an exhibition so quickly that responds to uh, the current uh, environment? And I to sort of point, point out that to be topical, it helps if you've been working on it for six years. Um, so, you know, so it was it's part of this issue was also that if there are things that are going on um, that people find of interest or are interesting for other people, they will then invite you in. So that was also the case with Cornell. That was the case, um, you know, with, with, with Goldsmiths, with Whitechapel. Um, and then when I moved over to Hong Kong, um, uh, people from Indonesia to Taiwan to Singapore were extremely interested about this project. And, and you know, not surprisingly, when Pratik and Priyanka, uh, I mean, they were very generous with the invitation to saying, speak what you, you know, want to speak about. We really hope you may want to think about, you know, including lines of control in there. Um, and, and I think it, it, it just sort of underlines the point that these are not issues that go away. I often describe uh, things that I want to tackle. I mean, exhibitions for me, as you can probably tell, are, are ways to think through, you know, what I'm going through life as well, trying to make sense of it. So these are questions that, that niggle, you know, like pebbles in a shoe. Uh, and, and this is a shoe that you can't take off, you know, so you're, you're perpetually in, uh, you know, you're feeling that, 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 that pebble. And, and for that to actually persist, it requires other people. Uh, this is not something that you could do. I mean, certainly I couldn't do on my own. Uh, it would not have been possible. Uh, hi, Hamad. It's Pedro here from Foray. It's a shame we weren't able to meet in person again. Um, Foray brought Hamad to Sydney in 2014, where he gave a really fantastic keynote on his work at Asia Art Archive. My question is, with lines of control, at least based on the, the slides I was able to see, and obviously it's limiting in this kind of format, um, a lot of the work seemed to be based, obviously, on, on the line of partition, on, on geography, on mapping, those sorts of questions. To what extent did the show address religion? And I ask that in the context of, say, Rubina, having spoken about the challenges she faced and decisions she made. And, of course, the word itself. It is partition, a sort of polite, bureaucratic way to say division, as opposed to some of the bullet points that were in your slide of of lines drawn in sand or drawn in water that are actually more questions of acquisition, um, be it, you know, for military, military bases in the Pacific, be it for natural resources, be it for sheer naked power. So did that show address this question of religious division? And if, show, if so, how? Uh, yeah, so I mean, sorry, I couldn't, um, you know, given the time, I, I couldn't, there were more than 40 artists that we showed uh, in Lines of Control. Um, and I think uh, Pratik and Priyanka have a physical book somewhere. And if they don't, uh, they'll sort of send, they can share a PDF and I'll share a PDF with you uh, later on. Um, but the full range of artworks that were shown in Lines of Control uh, very much address, uh, you know, religion pretty much front on. Um, so one particular work, which again, we brought back uh, into circulation, um, was a very early series of works by Iftikhar Dadi, which was looking at this sort of genre of, uh, of the graphic novel and, and looking at in particular um, there was one particular work which, which, uh, which literally the caption reads and, and, uh, and it becomes, uh, you know, time sometimes gives extra charge to certain works. And the caption for this particular work read, reads, uh, you know, 
uh, Muslims, uh, you know, like uh, hin uh, like beef, and and Hindus prefer a sweeter taste. You know, so this is the particular caption uh, that that runs with that, and there, there's a whole series of words, um, and and these things suddenly take on a, a charge. Um, and, you know, you could have there was a certain amount of charge when that work was produced in 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 the mid 90s. I would argue that charge has sort of it's gone nuclear uh, if that work is to be shown now. Um, and the the one instance uh, and I sort of the one instance I've actually managed to get the visa and been in India, I was lucky enough to vi visit the current Kiranadar Museum and see memorial in that wonderful show that Rubina showed us earlier. Uh, and one of the things I do remember was being struck by uh, not just the fact that it could be shown, but also the centrality of that work. Uh, that was very much the the heart of of the of the show. Um, and I sort of agree with the earlier comment I think that Lauren made that that was a very bold uh, curatorial stance. Uh, and I, I, you know, this work did not show in uh, in India. Uh, where Three Dreams Cross, for instance, we tried to travel to the NGMA, um, but we could not manage because the the Indian uh, it, the Indian government would not take a private show that would talk about Pakistan and Bangladesh alongside India, and would have to be broken up into, uh, you know, it would have to be government to government. But in terms of, uh, sorry, Pedro, your original question about different ranges of work, we had works from uh, Noah Lador, an Israeli artist who's looking at the Wailing Wall. Uh, and um, we had work uh, from Adam Bloomberg, Oliver Chanarin, looking at Mini Israel. So, you know, or Zarina Hashmi and, and you know, her commitment to the sort of idea of, of, of being an Indian Muslim. Um, and I think those were, were very much part and parcel. Um, the line as a feature, um, I think you're getting a slightly skewed perspective based on just the handful of works that I showed. Uh, my question goes back to uh, lines of control and the idea of three dreams. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in knowing when one talks about lines of control, which by far is one of the first uh, explorations of an art historical exploration of looking at the partition uh, also because of the scale and the kind of artists that are involved in it uh, at the same time as Dadi points out you know the creation of jargon jargons around partition like right up from the Holocaust to the genocide and uh, mm -hmm. all the scholarship within South Asia around partition that is that is coming up in the period between 1963 going all the way up to 1997. Uh, mm -hmm. Where does the art historical sort of converge and diverge from the historical knowledge production around the partition? I mean, I, I don't have a I don't have a simple answer for you, and I think it's also because I haven't I haven't dealt uh, I haven't tried to make those distinctions, and I must confess that most of my most of my readings when I was sort of looking at lines of control um, were not art historical. Uh, certainly not art historical in South Asia. So the things that I was looking at were ideas of commemoration, of memory. Um, I was looking at um, things like, in particular, um, and uh, Irit Rogoff and I had lots of uh, good uh, discussions uh, on this, was looking at the comparator between um, the treatment of uh, the, the Jewish Holocaust in, in Europe and its commemoration um, and its sort of vis visual uh, mark um, on, on, the, on the world's memory and compared to partition. And, and to think about why that was the case uh, and, and, and what, what was at play. Um, there, there, you know, there are a number of things. There's an issue around the, uh, I mean, just the fact that, I mean, I know that there is now being a, a partition museum built in, I think, in Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. um, but this is very recent. Um, certainly when Lines of Control was held, there were no memorials of any sort to partition anywhere in South Asia, uh, which is uh, curious to say the least. 
um, and, and, and suggests an attitude towards um, history, which is not dissimilar to what I was just dissing um, the British over as to how they, uh, how, you know, British history is, is, is taught uh, in school and, and presented as cultural constructions in museums uh, and films and, and popular culture. I think art history has a lot of work to do. Um, I think one of the, the great things about it is its conflation with visual culture is potentially opening it up to, um, to bodies of knowledge that have done far more work. So for, for lines of control, I was particularly interested in, uh, and I, uh, you know, in the scholarship of people like Amir Mufti, who has, uh, who has looked at uh, this through the lens of uh, uh, comparative literature, and, and, and particularly this idea of minor literature of the Luce and Qatari, and, and looked at all, partition almost through the lens of the Jewish question and enlightenment in Europe. Or Bhaskar Sarkar, uh, and his scholarship on, on film, um, and, and, you know, and, 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 and of course, and people like uh, Urvishi Bhattaria, um, you know, there is, I, I think there is more scholarship still outside art history than within um, and, and as to how this material uh, is looked at. And I think that's actually probably right. Um, I'm not sure that a pure art historical look will, will be able to provide that uh, that breadth uh, that that gives you uh, a meaningful context that that the visual cultural uh, uh, one would in conversation with literature and and film in particular. Hi, how about Lily here? Lily. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I was. I was Hoping to see you here. Anyway, uh, many conversations we've had, so I'll just ask you a simple one. Um, are you still calling Middle East West Asia? Well, you know, I, I never call Middle East, because, because the, you know, it always gets into the middle of what East to where conversation. Uh, let me turn that around to you, Lily. When you go back to Singapore, are you going to the Far East? <laughs> Southeast Asia. Mm. Okay. That's what we call now. Okay. But I, mean, I, I, I do think language is important. I, I, I don't want to get, get caught. I don't want to get caught up in pedantics, but I do think language is important. And I think, you know, Southeast Asia, West Asia, these are markers on a map. They are orientations, which uh, are, you know, I, I think kind of, you know, they do what they say on the tin. Things like Middle East, you know, Middle East, Near East, Far East, uh, I find them sort of borderline offensive terms. Uh, and I find it very curious, and I've asked really smart people, much smarter than me, uh, about why, so say, you know, artists in particular would, ha would not question being included within shows of the Middle East. You know, I don't know what that says. And I think it's one of the things that continues to uh, abuse and perplex me, but it's a, just a question of which particular fights you want to have. And I think, at, at, you know, I'd sort of bite my tongue uh, with a lot of the Middle East uh, usage of that, of that term. Oh, everybody's looking at me like I'm supposed to answer something. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it goes back to your point sort of at the beginning of the Q&A. Uh, which is when you talk about national and regional um, kind of labels being a real problem, that what's really more interesting are uh, the communities, the language groups, dialect groups, or whatever we want to call it, but that these constructs of nations and even Southeast Asia as a term yeah. is a very recent, it's a, almost a Cold War kind of thing. We never call ourselves Southeast Asians until Vietnam kind of mm. started happening and then Cold War started happening. So I, I, I completely uh, agree with you on that. And I, and I think that's the role for um, writers of art as well as curators of art, that we don't perpetuate uh, these kinds of terms. You know, and even the term Indianness is problematic. Yeah. Chineseness definitely is problematic for me. I'm from Taiwan. And going to Beijing, I knew that we were different kind of Chinese. 
You know, I used to say, okay, same father but different mother. No, no, I, uh, just just one reflection on that. I think in linking it to the, uh, the, the rock, paper, scissors and the National Pavilion of the UAE, um, I think if you look at the, the back of the book, which gives the name of artists who are in there, it, it actually reflects the fact that the UAE, you know, is, uh, although it has Arab in, in its middle, the art scene uh, is, is profoundly uh, international. Um, and they, uh, and, and as you present, you know, and what it does is, yes, it, it is, of course, a challenge as to how then one talks about a nation and how then one practices this, uh, uh, practices being a community. But I do think there is also an optimistic possibility in there of sort of new forms of cosmopolitanism that have a different relationship than sort of colonial imperial models or even simplistic mercantile uh, cosmopolitanisms that are often attached to places like Dubai or Singapore for that matter. So, you know, how does one perform home or how does one perform the nation? I think are really interesting questions. Um, and I think uh, in places like Dubai, in Singapore, you, you really do have, uh, I think, petri dishes of, uh, for us, for the world to think about the, these um, multifarious notions of belonging. Thank you, Hamad, and thank you for all of the questions. We, this was a, luckily a very stable connection, so we definitely felt you in the room. Thank you so much for this um, presentation and your critical thoughts. Thank you.